Welcome back to another episode of Built from the Inside Out. We loved our last guest so much that we decided to have her back on. So with us, Dr. Sarah and Sola, welcome and thank you for coming back. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yay. <laughs> yeah, so as we were talking off air, uh, we were talking about how I'm very interested right now in everything women's health related. So I'm personally like been doing a lot of research on a certain topic, but you have so much more info for women of all ages. So let's start off by talking about the menstrual cycle. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, kind of what we were talking about is it's so important for us to understand our menstrual cycle because for me as a um, Chinese medicine practitioner, we consider the menstrual cycle as your fifth vital sign, which is amazing because, you know, men don't have that, you know. Uh, they only have the four vital signs, you know, um, which is blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate, and heart rate. And so um, for women, we're so fortunate that we have a menstrual cycle. And, um, you know, growing up, at least here, it's funny because that's the one thing that we hate about ourselves. Um, we get so mad, like, oh, I wish I didn't have a cycle. I hate it. It's the worst time of the month. Or even it's become like a stereotype where people say, oh, you're on your cycle. That's why. Oh, and mm. like she's hormonal or this because she's on her cycle. You know, so like growing up, we look at it in like a, such a negative way. And we really don't like look at it with gratitude. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm 33, so... It took me a while to get there with the gratitude, right? Obviously, like, learning all about this. I'm like, oh, I'm so happy that I have something to measure about how my health is. Mm -hmm. Well, in Chinese medicine, it is a fifth vital sign. So anytime that a woman comes in to see me, she can have any kind of health complaint. But the number one thing that I get down to it is, how is your cycle? Because it tells me a lot about your health, you know, whether you have PMS, um, how your bleeding is, if there's clots, if there's brown spotting, if it's a light color, if it's dark color. So all of this tells me so much about your health. So after learning about that and getting educated in that, like I found a lot of value in it. And that's why now me and you are doing what we're doing, right? We're trying to educate yeah. others because the menstrual cycle is so valuable to understand. Um, I had actually never heard anyone say like, that you're thankful for your period. <laughs> it's always people complain. I grew up that way. Like, ugh, it's that time of the month. Ugh, I'm going to feel this way. Ugh, I'm going to be in pain. I know. We all grew up that way. Yeah. Me too. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess it wasn't until, like, I, I studied this medicine. And because, so women's health is, it's a really big part of TCM, you know, which dates back. We talked a little bit last time, but it dates back, you know, 6,000 years and um, and so there's a huge focus when we're looking at a body for a woman on her cycle because the cycle can predict everything, essentially. It can predict how your fertility is. It can predict, you know, maybe how your menopause will be. So in order to, like, fully understand someone's health, I need to understand the menstrual cycle. So I don't know. I hope that you find gratitude in it <laughs> later. Yeah. And um, I mean, yeah, when I was going through school and I was learning all this stuff, I got really curious. Mm -hmm. I went away from tampons and I started using the... Ooh, I was going to ask was you about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... We can talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to talk about it right now or... I mean, after. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We can come. We can come back to it. Anyways, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll, we can come back to it. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, this is short. All I was gonna say is I started using the Diva Cup, and the Diva Cup was like the beginning of that phase. I started using the Diva Cup in 2010, 2011, I was, and like a long time ago, and it was like you know the the medical grade silicone cup that you insert into your vagina, and oh. I didn't mean to hit that. And um, and so the blood flows into the cup versus, like, something absorbing it. Okay. And so when you pull it out, you have a collection of blood. Okay. And so when I was learning all of this, I would I switched over to this, and you pour it down the sink or down the toilet, and you really get to see, like, the quality clots, you know, the color. 
And um, and with, with a tampon, you don't really see that. And with a pad, you don't really see it too much because it's also being absorbed. And so the cotton changes the color. But um, we, we can swing back around to that, uh, why those are so great. But we can talk about it. Yeah. So I hate tampons, but I have to use them when I go to the gym. You know, but I have a cousin who would always tell people, like, don't use tampons. They're bad. And I never, I've never taken, like, the time to actually look into it. Are they bad for you? Uh, yeah. Um, Why is it? So, it, yes and no. Everything is, is with balance, right? So mm-hmm. tampons can be bad if you're buying, like, you know, the the big, the big name brands, you know. Uh, oftentimes they clean the cotton with chemicals or they bleach mm-hmm. it. And there's been a lot of, um, like, chemicals found in those products. And so... When you're inserting that into your vagina, the lining of the vagina is very, very thin. So actually, those chemicals are easy to penetrate and be absorbed into the vagina. So um, some thought is that those chemicals, they affect your hormones, you know, and they can lead to cancer. Like a lot of them are cancerous, and there's a huge list. I actually pulled this up, um, like, earlier today, Look, reading over the list, and there's so many like endocrine disruptors. And so when it comes to infertility, which we'll talk about later, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, so many women are having trouble with fertility now Mm. more than ever before. And we're constantly trying to understand why. Well, that could be a contributing factor is that your body is absorbing these chemicals and it's affecting your endocrine system. They're called endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals. And so that could lead to infertility. That could lead to PCOS, which is also on the rise, you mm-hmm. know, um, among other things, among cancer. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah. And that's something we're not taught either because we use no. them every month and we don't know. This. Like the other day I was on TikTok and someone, I don't know why, but they used a tampon to like get the grease from the food they were cooking. And people in the comments were like, that's disgusting. It has chemicals. And and I'm like, it has chemicals? Like, first of all, I thought that was gross that they did that. Like, why are they putting it in their food? But then I was like, wait, what? It has chemicals? Yeah. Okay. So now, like, you see it more, like, when you go to the grocery store and you're in the aisle and you're looking for, you know, feminine product that um, so oftentimes there's some that say is, you know, natural, natural, it's chlorine-free, it's unbleached, no mm-hmm. chemicals. So they're really trying to advertise for that. So if you want to use a tampon, I would always say, like, opt out for, like, that healthier choice, right? That's not okay. endocrine disrupting. That could, you know, really affect your body um, and your genetic constitution. But then, so in that case, it's okay, right, if you get a, a natural, like, a safe one. But then in my theory of medicine, what I learned is that blood is supposed to flow down and out. And whenever you're inserting a tampon, you're blocking the flow of traffic. So Mm -hmm. it's not able to flow down and out. So it's like a a backup in your body. And it can lead to, you know, like disrupted flow. The tissue might not be as healthy because you're not really allowing it to flow, depending on how often you're changing your tampon, you know, Mm -hmm. like if you're keeping it in 12 hours or longer, like absolutely that wouldn't be, you know, suggested, yeah. um, you know, and then could lead to toxic shock syndrome. Crazy enough. I'll talk about this story because um, it's so interesting. I had a patient come in. Um, this was like a couple of months ago and like she had given birth, started her period. And so she went back to tampon usage. Well, after birth, you're, vaginal canal is um is different it's larger I feel like things can get hidden in it um your body just changes so much and so she used a tampon and she didn't realize that like it never came out and she started having she came to me because she was spotting and having problems um and I told her you need you you need to go get blood work you need to get this done um and then she said she had pain went to the ER found out that the tampon had been stuck in there for four months Mm -hmm rotting you know and so like innocent mistake on her end she was probably exhausted like she couldn't see it forgot who knows right Mm -hmm. no judgment there but um like that can really happen you know and it could be it could be deadly essentially you know that something like that could cost you your life because then you develop an infection and 
you know, if you don't understand it. So I think, you know, when it comes to that, you know, try not to put like any foreign thing into your body that could block the flow, could get lost or could cause like endocrine disrupting, you know, problems within your body. So I would recommend opting out for a pad or, um, you know, one of the natural cups that you put in that catches the flow instead of blocks the flow. Okay. So <laughs> I think I've heard of it, but I'm very like, when I've done something for so long, it's, it, it takes a lot for me to like move away from it. Yeah. But because I know that they have chemicals in them and that's not, and I don't like using them anyway. Yeah. So tell us about the Diva Cup. Yeah. Yeah. So the Diva Cup, there's so many different types of cups now. Like I, I had, and it will last you for 10 years. Like it will last you a long time as long really? as you properly clean it. Yes. Um, so I had went to Target to get a new cup and I got the new cup. I want to say it's like the Lola cup or I don't know. Target has so many different options. Diva okay. cup is like old school, the OG one. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, so it's, you know, it's circular and then it looks like a cone and then it has a stem on it. Um, and it's made of medical grade silicone and it's definitely a learning curve. It okay. is a learning curve. You have to fold it a certain way, kind of like a taco, and then insert it. And then you have to, once it inserts and it opens, you have to kind of twist it and pull it so that it creates like a suction uh -huh. um, along the tissue. But, you know, even when you pull it out, like it's it's such a learning curve. And I will be honest that, you know, I had pulled it out and blood would spill. It would spill on me. It would go everywhere because... I felt like I was a kid learning how to walk. Like it was something so foreign and new. Mm -hmm. um, but I always tried to change it like at home where if I had an accident, I'd go, oh, okay, like I can change, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that you keep in for 12 hours. So it lasts a long time, you know. Really? And it's not like a tampon. You know, when you pull a tampon out, it's painful. Mm -hmm. This one is not like that. Like it, it doesn't hurt. You know, you could put it in and then you could take it out in three hours. It's not going to hurt to take it out either. Hmm. So, okay, yeah, so I recommend look into that. Yeah, yeah, I recommend it. But um, I, I've told a lot of people in my practice, you know, like, mm -hmm. hey, like, try this. And I know everyone's like, you get scared because I don't want to bleed on myself or it sounds intimidating. But, you know, what I did is I got on YouTube and I watch videos of like how to fold it and how to insert it. You know, YouTube mm -hmm. is such a good. And I guess yeah. that's TikTok nowadays, too. Yeah. You know, on like mm -hmm. what what that would look like. You that's know. what I was thinking. I'm going to go on TikTok and YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I definitely recommend it. So, um, yeah. I'm yeah. going to try it because yeah. yeah, I hate tampons. I know. But I, I have been scared. It, it does sound intimidating, but yeah, I'm going to go for that. Yeah, yeah, you should try it. I yeah. recommend it. And you know that you're doing something good for your body. Right. You know, um, and, and kind of like I know what we'll talk about, like whether you know you want to have kids or you don't want to have kids when you're younger, you know, and life changes. But trying to opt out for things that, like, support your body, that don't disrupt your hormones, mm -hmm. that are non-cancerous, you know, just for, like, a healthy, long life, you know, yeah. whatever your life will look like with or without kids in the future. But, yeah. yeah. And that's why it's so important to learn all these things while you're young. Yeah. So for someone who's, like, a teen, what would you say is important for them to know about their menstrual cycle? Gosh, yeah, that's a really good one. Um I think just, you know, understanding it um, and and knowing that, like, it's okay that you have a menstrual cycle and you're just as great and perfect, you know, on it and off it. Um, you know, I remember as a teen for me, like, I definitely had, like, a, a lot of hormonal, like, highs and lows, you know, and so just like connecting that to your cycle kind of like what you've already been talking about and doing you know mm -hmm. is like how to work out when you're on your cycle or what to eat when you're on your cycle so like setting those foundational blocks are obviously important if mm -hmm. the teen can you know get access to that or hopefully they have really great parents or families that can kind of like um, you know feed them with that information um, but I, I think the main thing is just um, you know kind of honoring it and, you know, allowing for the process, you know, uh, opting for pads or, you know, diva cups, just depending how comfortable they are with like insertion of anything and also like how old they are, um, you know, and, and just, I guess a big one too is taking rest, you know, 
mm-hmm. on your cycle. That's what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, because teens are very active and they want to go out and they want to do like there's a lot of energy, but just kind of like forcing a rest. Like, okay, you're on your cycle. Like, just rest. Take it, take it easy. Eat mm-hmm. warm foods. You know, drink lots of water. And just putting, like, value onto that, um, I think, is, like, the first thing that I would just recommend. Like, just honoring Mm -hmm. yourself when you're on your cycle versus just being, like, oh, I'm on my cycle, like, you know, unconsciously, like, not even thinking, like, let me insert a tampon or a pad and, like, let me go. But, you know, just really understanding, like, hey, um, what a healthy cycle looks like, you know. Um, Are you having PMS? Are you having, like, a lot of pain and stabbing, cramping while you're on your cycle? Because I had a friend in high school, and she would throw up on her cycle and have so much pain that she would have to leave school. Oh, wow. You know, and back then I was like, oh, man, like, I feel so bad for her. But now I, I look at that, I'm like, oh, like, you know, there there could have been adjustments that could have been made, you know, to her health, um, to her diet, you know, um, like not eating so much fast food and eating more like mm-hmm. fresh foods prepared at home or soups, you know, during that time. Yeah. Um, and also like um, maintaining stress is a huge one, you know, for adolescents, oh, yeah. like keeping your stress down because stress is going to lead to PMS and it's going to lead to like severe cramping. Um, and then another thing too is um, like avoiding cold water And, um, like when I was younger, I didn't really know about that, but I used to think, and this is so silly. Um, but when I was on my cycle, I'd be like, don't get into the the beach water because a shark is going to smell you and it's going to get you, you know? And so like, I just, I I had connected that, like, maybe it's not a good time to go swimming, you know, when you're bleeding, Mm -hmm. but like, actually, like after learning, you know, the medicine that I learned, when women are on their cycles, we usually recommend not to go swimming because it's a lot of, like, the pool is really cold. And when you get out um, and, you know, like, in the cool air or the wind, like, it, it leads to a colder abdomen. And that decreases your flow of blood and can cause more pain and, like, um, discomfort during your cycle. And so that's another thing, too, when I think of teenagers is, you know, like, just being mindful of maybe, like, that week opting out of swimming or you know, of, um, you know, like exposing your area, you know, to like colder temperatures. Okay. Just like the, yeah, just like the basics of getting familiar with it and not hating it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so interesting because I feel like a lot of us growing up, we don't know, we're not taught a lot about health in general. Absolutely. Because I remember when I was young, that's what we would do. We'll eat fast food or we eat whatever. Yeah. And my mom, actually, she would be into like, she'll have her like her little health kicks here and there where she'll be like you have to drink this green juice but other than that she and I don't know if she even knows now like everything I've been learning recently um is something that wasn't taught to me uh when I started competing just eating healthy overall yeah it's not something that's especially not in like Hispanic homes I want to say yeah I don't know I would I yeah same <laughs> same yeah. for me same how I was raised um I think, you know, really what it is, is that, like, our our moms, and I don't want to just point fingers at our moms, but, you know, mm-hmm. they're women too, like, mm-hmm. they they weren't raised or brought up that way either, so, like, I put so much love onto them because they were unaware too, it's like the blind leading the blind, you know, right. like, what, yeah. what could they have done when, like, they didn't know, mm-hmm. and, um, like, when I started my period, I was 10, And, like, my mom never talked to me about that. Like, and now we have this conversation. She's like, well, I wanted to, but I didn't know how to approach it because nobody talked to me about it. Mm. Like, you know, and I remember I was crying. I was like, oh, my God, I'm bleeding. What is this? Like, uh," you know, and I was scared and I felt, like, lost. Mm -hmm. And so my mom was like, well, I felt that way, too. And, like, and so I, anyways, I think it's beautiful that, like, me and you are, like, working so much on understanding ourselves because when Mm -hmm. you put that like love into yourself like once you have kids like it's just going to naturally flow out of you you know and you're going to want to educate them and guide them but um yeah crazy I know my mom did tell me she was like there's going to be one day this is going to happen but that's it you know that's she's like it's going to come every month but not to the extent to what I've been learning like now I whenever I'm like okay I'm going to be I look at my calendar I'm like okay these days I'm going to be on my period. So I'm looking forward now to like resting. 
or yeah. I know what foods to eat or I know how not to train. Don't mm-hmm. go heavy in the gym or, yes. you know, it's okay if you just, all you do all day is take a walk and uh-huh. not get a real workout in. Like, it's okay. Yeah. And uh, also, like, another thing that, that I wasn't really taught was, like, just pregnancy in general. To me, it was like, you have sex and you're going to get pregnant. Yes. And that's it. That's that's all I knew. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And that's something that I wanted to talk about, too. Yeah, you know, like, that. being teenagers, mm-hmm. like... Because when I was a teen, you know, my mom was a pregnant teen. And okay. so it's crazy because she was like, I don't want what happened to me happen to you, mm-hmm. you know. I'd like, just don't have sex because you'll get period, you'll get pregnant. Mm-hmm. And so, like, now, obviously, after studying the medicine, it's like, oh, well, I mean, it's a lot harder to get pregnant than what we think, you know. But when you're young and you're healthy and you're carefree, like, it just seems to happen, right? Yeah. Um, but there's only, like, a certain, like, week out of the whole four weeks out of the whole month that you can really get pregnant. Um, And so in order to like know what that week is, you have to know how to count your cycle, Um, which a lot of girls don't know. And I for sure didn't know that until maybe like my mid twenties, late twenties, like really understanding what that was, you know, and now there's so many applications like the flow, um, you know, app that you can get and it helps you. But um, you know, so like once you first start bleeding, is cycle day one. And if you have spotting before that, you know, like brown spotting, fresh red blood spotting, like that doesn't count. Like the first day is when you actually start like bleeding, you know, okay. where you need like something to soak it, soak it up, right? Mm-hmm. And so from there, you just count, okay, cycle day one, two, three, four, up to 10, up to 12, you know, and you continue to count. And obviously having an app helps you to remember. Mm-hmm. But most cycles are around from like 28 days to 32 days. So what that means is most women ovulate around cycle day 14 to 16. Okay. And what ovulation is, is you're releasing an egg, you know, um, from your ovaries down the fallopian tubes into the uterus. And hopefully there's um, sperm there that can, you know, connect with it and create a baby, right? We are made to reproduce. And, um, and if you don't want that, then you avoid having intercourse around that time period. So usually things that you look out for in order to understand when you're fertile, whether you want to conceive or you don't, um, is counting your days, you know, around cycle day 14 and 16 is when you're most likely to get pregnant because that's when the egg is dropping. But you can also get pregnant before those days and after those days, So usually I would say if you do not want to get pregnant, avoid any intercourse, especially unprotected, like three days before that and five days after that. So that would look like, you know, um, cycle day 11 to cycle day, was it 21? Mm -hmm. Um, And you just try to abstain. But if you want to get pregnant, then that's when you would have unprotected sex you know, um, usually I say every other day, um, and hopefully you would get pregnant. But, you know, as kids, you're so unaware and uneducated. It's like, I can get pregnant anytime. And I even remember being younger, and I was like, even if I'm bleeding and on my menstrual cycle, I could still get pregnant. Like, just don't have sex, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I was, I I just didn't know, but actually that's not the case. It's like just that certain time frame. So three days before and five days after. And then what you want to pair with that, with your app and counting down the days, is your discharge. So that's like another thing to understand your body, you know, not just when you're bleeding, but when you're not. Like pulling down your panties and looking at what's inside. You can learn so much about yourself, you know, or even how, like when you wipe, like is it stretchy, is it sticky? And when you're ovulating, usually the mucus changes to like egg white consistency. So I tell people like if you want to know what, that looks like when you're fertile, like crack an egg and look at the egg white and be like, okay, this is what, you know, if I have this, that means I'm extremely fertile and I can get pregnant at any moment, you know? So like, again, doesn't matter where you are, like in your life, Mm -hmm. if you see that, try to abstain, you know, from intercourse. It's, it's funny because like, Our bodies are made to reproduce whether we want to or not. Like that's the whole purpose of our reproductive system, right? And that's what makes us, you know, female. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, if you you don't 
want to, then you just have to be like really mindful to try not to have intercourse. But the body tricks you because that's usually often when your libido is really high, <laughs> you know, and like science can prove it. That's like women will walk with a sway. Like when they're ovulating, mm-hmm. like you'll smell different, you'll look different, you talk different, like the tone of your voice goes a little bit higher. There's a lot of yeah. science behind it. Um, there's a really good documentary and I can't remember what it's called, but I want to say it's like the science behind love or something. I watched it on YouTube. Okay. And so it like breaks all of those parts down and it's just so interesting yeah. that like <laughs> even if you're like, okay, don't have sex during this time because you mm-hmm. don't want to get pregnant. There's so much going on deeper, you know, with your libido peaking and, you know, like your voice changing and the way you move that you're more attractive, you know. So you just really, it's so interesting. You have to like really fight against it. I mean, you can't shut yourself in a house for a whole week, (laughs) but, um, you know. Cancel all your dates. (laughs) I know, cancel all the dates because you're looking good. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's, it's just really cool. Like once you get into it, like what really happens when you're ovulating. Um, but then if you want to get pregnant, then, you know, who cares? Like, that's when you're looking the best. So. Yeah. <laughs> and that's so interesting. And, like, we weren't talking off the air. Like, I never took the interest in learning any of this because I used to not want kids. Like, just the thought of kids scared me. The birth, the raising them, how the world is right now. I Am I going to be a good parent? So oh whenever I met my husband, that's when I changed my mind. And I think it's, well, one, because I finally saw myself with someone and then, like, stable forever. And then, two, I was hitting my late 20s. So I was like, do I, don't I? And I was like, I, I think I do. And then yeah. I would just get, like, baby fever here and there. And I was like, well, let's get married first and then, you know. <laughs> and then figure it out. Yeah. yeah. And then you were saying you also. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I know. It's crazy because, like, everything you said, like, why you didn't want to have kids, mm-hmm. that's exactly why I didn't want to have kids. And, um you know, I've been with my husband since like we were 17, you know, we dated oh. for a long time before we got married. But I remember telling him like, I don't want kids. And he was like, he gave me the ultimatum. Well, like, if you don't want kids, you better tell me because this won't work. All I've ever wanted to do is be a dad. And so I was so like impressed, like, how do you know that that's all you've ever wanted to be? And I hear people say like, all I've ever wanted to be is a mom. Mm-hmm. But for me, I had so much fear, like, behind what that like, reality would be and that fear is what like created this blockage of like I don't want kids you know I was so scared of the birth of the pain what do you do with the kid like the way the world is you know um but you know I told him like okay like I'll I'll have kids with you it's not that like I love you and like I I feel like I can overcome this and so one way I overcame it is by like you know educating myself a lot about it you know so that I felt like confident and empowered that Mm -hmm. like okay like this is what would happen this is what it would look like I think I can do this you know Mm -hmm. um and so I hope like everyone like listening or watching like if if you ever felt that way just know that like you can't overcome that fear you know like both of us did yeah yeah and I have two right yeah 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 Yeah, absolutely that's awesome yeah so I think like no matter what in life like you might be a little hesitant but, you know, now I have kids. I have Camila's five, Sebastian is three, and, like, I wouldn't change them for the world. Like, I love them so much, and they make me so happy. And so I always find it, like, so interesting when I look back, and I'm like, I can't, I, I can't, and I can't believe that I said that because now it's, like, they're what I live for, you know. Yeah. And it's so, and, you know, the birth wasn't bad. You know, like, I did a lot of meditation, like hypnobirthing. I prepared for it. I took classes. I was going to ask you, so how did you, since you studied this, how did how was your birth? This episode was brought to you by BCN Supplements, our all-natural supplement company. First off, we have our hydrolyzed collagen. This is a four-in-one. It comes with vitamin C for better absorption, hyaluronic acid, and biotin. So this is good for your skin, your hair, your nails, and your joints. And this is for both men and women. Next up, we have our immunity, which is a 7-in-1 vitamin. It has vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, echinacea, elderberry, black pepper, and garlic bulb. So this will give your immune system that extra boost. And lastly, we have our natural pre-workout. It does have 325 milligrams of natural caffeine from green tea. It is sweetened with stevia. 
and its purpose is energy, focus, and endurance. And for our listeners, we do have a discount code. If you visit our website, www.bcnsupps.com, you can use code BUILT, B-U-I-L-T, for 10% off. Thank you so much for listening. Um, well, both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, your kid's birth, not yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that one? I don't know. Um, yeah, so I actually got pregnant like halfway through my my degree. And um, and it was great because I got acupuncture like all of the time. I did it once a week. And it really, really helped me during my pregnancy. I um, like if I had aches or pains or the nausea, like I would get acupuncture and it was amazing. So I guess that's when I first like really fell in love with it for women's health, like what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I was like, oh my God, I feel like nine day different. And um, yeah, but I had a lot of stress. I had a lot of stress because I was in a doctorate program and and I was working and I just had like a lot of, you know, responsibilities. So I didn't like fully enjoy the pregnancy per se, because I was just so tense, you know, and I see that a lot working with other women too, you know. Um, but like the birth was good because I, I trained, you know, like I went into like a very deep meditative state and it was, you know, all in all, it was good. Did you have them in a hospital? Or? Yeah. So yeah. Camila, I had in a hospital, but I had it with midwives. So okay. like they practice everything naturally. So it was great. Like they, and this would be like a huge conversation for like another time because I could talk hours about this but um like compared to like you know medical doctors and like uh, midwives like they let me move around I was able to take a shower while I was in labor at the hospital um they massaged me like it was very therapeutic and I didn't get any medications I didn't get any epidural like I did it all like just me it was just me in a room (laughs) And so, like, that was really good. And I remember after the birth and the nurse that was assigned to the room, she came in and she was like, uh, I usually come in to administer medicine, but, like, you don't have any medicine. Like, did you give birth without any medicine? And I was like, yeah, I I just, I did it, like, you know, all natural. Like, I I don't know. She was like, this is so weird because, like, I never see this. And, like, you're, like, a first. And so I I was like, oh, okay, wow, like, it's, it's crazy because like so many women like they go into the hospital to give birth Mm -hmm. and when you're uneducated or unaware like they just put so many things on you like hey you got to take this you got to do this hey now the doctor said you got to do this you know and so they just like fall into like the system of being like okay well whatever the doctor says like I'll do it Mm -hmm. you know but actually like there's so many pros and cons to like a lot of different things that, you know, that they do in the hospital. And if you don't know, you don't know how to advocate for yourself. So, mm-hmm. but for me, I knew ahead of time, like, this is what I want. This is what I don't want. And these are the reasons why. So it really like helped my birth a lot. Um, and then with Sebastian, I gave birth at home in my bathtub. Oh, really? Yeah. How was that? Um, it was way easier than the hospital. Really? Yeah. It was easier because like, think of this. If you were really, really sick with the flu or something, you know, not to compare that to birth, but birth is like, it's a lot on your body, you know, and Mm -hmm. it's taxing, you know, like, where would you want to be? Would you rather be in a hospital room, like fighting a flu for a whole week, you know, with a bed and watching a TV? Or would you rather be home and in bed where your mom could cook food or your husband and could bring it to you? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's how I look at birth. Like, birth is so exhausting and there's like physically stuff happening, like, you might poop yourself, you might, you know, like so many things are coming out of like your private area, you know, um, like fluid before the baby, your water breaks, you know, and so it's so nice to be home, to take a shower if you need to, to wash off, to get in bed and your blankets to cuddle, like, you know, um, my mother-in-law came over the day after the baby was born, she was cooking breakfast for everyone, like I was in my bed and I had breakfast served to me and it was just so so relaxing you know like there's no place like home truly but a lot of people don't pick that setting because they're scared right like they don't know what birth looks like and and we're like in America we feel that we need to have birth in a hospital um, and that's just like how we're trained but actually in a lot of other countries you don't go immediately to a medical doctor you actually get assigned a midwife and only get assigned to a medical doctor if you have any complications or health problems. Okay. Because doctors are trained to save lives. Um, 
And there's no need for saving a life in a natural birth setting. Right. Yeah. So okay. that's where, like, a lot of, like, the interventions and the medicine and, you know, I mean, they'll cut your perineum, you know, with scissors, which is the skin between the vagina and the anus. If, the, if they think okay. the baby's head's too big, they don't need permission. They'll just get scissors and cut it, you know, in a hospital. And so it's, like, a little bit aggressive because they're trained to save lives. Oh, wow. So what would you say to someone who wants to have a natural birth but is also scared that there will be a complication? Um, So, you know, I would just say, like, shop around and do what feels good. You know, like meet with, if you want to look at a medical doctor in a hospital, like go on a hospital tour, meet with that doctor, ask them questions, you know. Like there's questions that you can find on I'm sure on Google um, to see like what are important questions to have when doing a hospital tour, you know, for a birth or meet with a midwife or a birth center and ask them questions like, um, you know, and, and kind of see like, hey, if something happens and I need to go to a hospital, like what are your statistics? Like how often does it happen? Like how far away are we from the hospital? What would the protocol be? And like you just have to really like advocate for yourself because – Unfortunately, no one does it, you know, like there's no like helper to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's what I would recommend. And then like mm-hmm. just go with your gut and what feels good because home birth was cool for me the second time. Is it for everyone? No. Would it be great for me the third time? I don't know. You know, like you just have to cross that bridge when you get there okay. and like be honest with yourself, like what feels good and feels right for me um, and my baby at this time. So now that we're in the topic of birth, Something I'm very curious about, the placenta. Yes. I hear people talking about this. Yes. What is it good for? What is it does? Do you need to keep it? Is it okay for them to take it away? Yeah. All the, all the, what, tell me everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I love the placenta. So, actually, when I was studying my medicine, the placenta is an herb that we learn about. It's a, considered a traditional Chinese medicine herb. And the reason is because after you give birth, when you eat the placenta, it helps to stabilize your hormones, rebuild the blood that's been lost, um, helps with iron, you know. And, um, and so there's a lot of other mammals that eat their placenta after the baby's born, really? almost for a survival thing, you know, of like having a very nutrient-dense meal after you lose a lot of blood. Because when you give birth, you know, you bleed a lot, you lose a lot of fluids, you feel very depleted and very fatigued, you know, like it just, it, it's everything, it takes the life out of you. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are a lot of mammals that do that. And, um, and placenta encapsulation is a big trending thing now. And I, I'm a big, you know, I, I'm a big believer of it. I didn't do it with my first daughter, but after my second son, I actually did placenta encapsulation where I kept the placenta, and I I paid for a company to come pick it up from the hospital, take it back, clean it, wash it, dehydrate it, and um, put it into capsule form. And I have to tell you that whenever I took the pills, like, I felt really, really good. Like, I felt, like, not so moody. I had more energy. Like, I I could just tell, like, I, I would perk up and be like, oh, my body feels stronger. So, like, Comparing it from my first birth to my second birth, like, it made a huge difference. Um, Is it for everyone? I don't know. Like, some people are really weirded out by, you know, eating, like, their placenta, and I get that. But, um, but, you know, there is a lot of, like, benefits to it. And if you're open to it, then why not, you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess, like, how you would bridge that is if you have, you know, if you're birthing in a hospital, you have to talk to your medical doctor ahead, let them know. Um, So that after the birth, they can keep it for you. And then it can be picked up right after the birth. So, Yeah, because I've seen uh, videos on TikTok about how people are like, oh, I went to the hospital and they they just wanted to take it. They didn't want to give it back to me. Or they were trying to charge them to give it back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I haven't had kids, so I don't know. It's just things I see on yeah. the internet. Yeah, I um, I had um, two births because I was a doula, so you know, I helped women through birth, mm-hmm. and I had two births like that where, like, the, one the placenta was lost, and they were like, 
sorry, we can't find it. We don't know where it went, you know. And that mom was so stressed because she was like, well, I told them ahead of time I wanted to keep it, yeah. you know. And when she walked in in labor, she had a piece of paper, like her birth plan. So mm -hmm. that's something we can get into later. But, you know, okay. your birth plan is like you're just giving a letter to the team, your nurses, of like everything that you want and you don't want. Mm -hmm. um, and so she gave that to them. And on the birth plan, I said she wanted to keep the placenta. And we called for like two days, like trying to find it. And they were like, no, we don't know where it is. Like, sorry. And so I felt really bad for her, you know, because it just got lost. Oh. And then um, with another birth, they said, oh, we need to send it to pathology. And they're like, okay, because I guess it looked different. And they sent it to pathology, and then they just didn't release it. So, um, and they never found anything from it. But, you know, they, they had to, like, I don't know, like, sample it and check it out. And then by that time, like, it was, you know, they couldn't use it. So I've definitely heard of a lot of those stories. You mm -hmm. know, some women, like, it works out, you know, when they get to keep the placenta. And then some women, like, something just happens to the placenta, you know. It disappears or it like the hospital will take it. I've never heard about the hospital taking it and charging someone for it though. That's yeah. new to me. I mean, I don't know. It was on TikTok. I don't know. But I thought I was like, that's crazy. That's your body. I know. Like that's a part of your body. Mm -hmm. where they try and charge you to get it back. Yeah. I but. I wouldn't be surprised if some hospitals or some places like operate it like that though. Yeah. I don't I I think I would want to do it naturally. But we'll, we'll talk about that once we're ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's something that, like, you and your husband, like, y'all can talk about. Because for me, like, with my first pregnancy, I told my husband, like, I want to do it at home or in, a, in like, um, a birthing center. And he was like, absolutely not. Like, that sounds scary to me. So we compromised, you know. And that's, like, oh, okay. the beauty of life and having a relationship yeah. is you compromise. You're like, okay, these are these are what I really want. And, you know, whatever makes him feel comfortable, too, because, like, he's your birthing person and, like, you're doing this together, bringing a baby in. Yeah. Um, so you just have to give and take a little bit, and you'll find, like, a happy medium. Yeah. I don't, th I don't think we've really talked about it much. It would, I've just had, like, some of my cousins tell me stories, and they didn't have the greatest experiences, but that's, like, both hospital and at home. So. Oh, Wow. Yeah, so that's why I'm like, I want to make sure, so, because I'm so, it's something that I've been so scared of my whole life, I'm like, uh -huh. I want to make sure I do things right, and so, yeah, yeah. and so now we're going to go see you, and I know. Gonna start working with you. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be good, yeah, I'm excited yeah. Um, to work with you guys for fertility, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it makes a big difference, like it really does, um, even just like, you know, getting an evaluation, like y'all are young and like having someone like me to just tell you like, hey, your cycle looks good, your health looks good. Because I can tell like after I, you know, do my initial intake, mm -hmm. like pretty much like how your health is and how your fertility is. Okay. And so like after working with you for a while, like there was one person I was working with her for a while. And um, and then I was I told her like, I see everything is perfect. Like your health looks good. Like, you're very, very fertile, you know? And so I, I can get to a point to where I can tell people, like, you're so fertile, like, you should get pregnant in no time. It's just timing. And sometimes that's what it comes down to. It's just, like, the moment, you know, like, yeah. the timing. Um, but, yeah, it'll, like, I'm excited to work with you guys. And, yeah, and of course, like, too. I'll give you advice for, you know, when, it, when you're pregnant and it comes time to, like, giving birth and all that, like, what that would look like. Because there's a lot of good support systems here in Houston for that. Okay, yeah, and I like that you say you work with the couple like three months before, during, postpartum. Yeah, I'm gonna need that. I feel like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's all it's all important. So yeah, usually like three months before is just like helping to optimize like both of y'all's fertility through acupuncture and herbal medicine, okay. and then once you're pregnant, like the first trimester, preventing miscarriage is a big goal. So helping to keep your progesterone levels levels elevated. Um, and then when you get further down, then it's just like keeping your body relaxed and calm so that you can have like a positive birth. And, um, before like my patients ever give birth, then we're already talking about like postpartum, you know, like how can you take care of yourself in postpartum and like kind of setting up like a postpartum plan. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I feel like that's also not something that a lot of people think about. You just hear about postpartum depression, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, it's very common. Yeah. Instead of, it's very common, but here's what you could do to not 
go that route. Exactly. Yeah. Like, how can you prevent it, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like, a lot of people don't don't talk about it. And even, like, I remember in the hospital, like, I, I never really got questions on, like, you know, like, emotionally or mentally, like, how was I doing, you know? Like, when I was pregnant, I would go in. They would, like, listen to the baby's heart. They would measure, you know, ask, like, a few questions. They're like, okay, you're good to go. We'll see you in, like, so many weeks. Um, but nobody was like, hey, like, how are you holding up? Like, how are you feeling about this birth? Like, really getting into, like, those deep, important, like, talks. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do in my practice. Um, but definitely, like, in the, you know, Western medical system, like, that's not, um, you know, maybe in another private practice, but at least in the hospital, like, that's not what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then I get people come to me like, oh, I have postpartum depression. And, like, then it's really, you know, it's a little bit scary. Um, it's, like, a, you know, very sensitive and vulnerable time for them mm -hmm. to try to, like, bring them out of it. But, you know, like, it's like <laughs> walking, walking, you know, like, in the grass and there's, like, a big – or, like, down the road and there's a big pothole and you fall into it. You know, and then it's like, oh, we got to get you out of this pothole. But what if we, like, fixed the, the, the mm -hmm. you know, the gravel and, like, covered the pothole so you never fell in? And that's right. what, like, this medicine's all about. A huge part of Chinese medicine is prevention. Okay. Like, preventing things before it ever happens. Mm -hmm. So usually once, like, my patients are feeling good, I tell them, like, well, come in because I'll see you once a, week, once a month. And we, like, prevent from anything happening, right? Because if you stay in balance, then, you know, ideally you wouldn't get diagnosed with cancer. You wouldn't develop any type of diseases, diseases, you know, even in pregnancy, you know, like preeclampsia. So, yeah. What is that? Pre so I actually got diagnosed with preeclampsia my first <laughs> my first time. Um, but I had uncontrolled um, blood pressure, and it would spike really high, so much to where it started, like, damaging my liver and my kidneys while I was pregnant. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. And it, what did you have to do for that? I had to go on bed rest. Uh, yeah, for a okay. month. And then they, they induced me early at um, 37 weeks, and I gave birth early. Um, I did it to myself, though, because I was I was always, like, really driven. And so mm -hmm. I was a doctorate student, and then I worked nights, and I would take care of, like, women in postpartum. So I would work all night from, like, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., get home, sleep for like a few hours and then I would go to school so oh. I did it I did it to myself and even like my mentors and my teachers and the people that did acupuncture for me they told me like you really need to stop this is not healthy you know for your body but I um I really felt like I was invincible because like I've always been really healthy you know mm -hmm. before having kids but it's crazy because once you get pregnant like everything changes like you really do have to slow down and so yeah. for people that are really like fast-paced like I was, mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to like grasp that concept of like, okay, like I have to slow, I have to actually slow down. I can't like keep going at full speed. Yeah. And I think even before, well, for me, I feel like I realized it. I've never been pregnant, but I, something I realized, and I think it started with like, started listening to people talk about feminine energy and masculine energy yeah. and all those things and like how men and women really are different. And like a lot of the way we do things is based off of, how the man works and at first I was like whatever and then I started really I was like yeah that's right so I was like as a woman I don't need to be pushing myself like a man pushes himself because oh, yeah. they can handle it as a woman we want to think we can handle it but really our bodies aren't really designed for that yeah yeah absolutely yes it's so true um yeah uh, our energies are so different um mm -hmm. and even though, like that's a big part of like my medicine and like how we diagnose, right? Mm -hmm. It's like men have like this young, this like very masculine energy that's like strong and f like fiery and blazing upward. And like women, it's very like, you know, nurturing mm -hmm. and calming and soothing and slower. Um, so yeah, I, I think you're spot on with that. Yeah. yeah, because I used to be like that too. I was so driven and I was going to do all these things. And I mean, I, I did a lot of things, but then later I realized I was like, I feel better when I slow down. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. Taking, like, more rest and, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, our bodies are just different and our hormones are different and they're made to do different things. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But So going back to what you were talking about, the fifth vital sign. So you said you're able to tell someone kind of, like, where they're at in their health based off of, like, 
if they're getting PMS, if they have clots, yeah. pains. So talk to me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So um, it's funny because like a lot of people consider PMS as normal. Um, but for me and my medicine, like we consider it as like an abnormal sign. <laughs> so usually if you have PMS, then we can link it back to you have like higher stress or something, you know, going on where whether it's like mental stress or physical stress, and then that leads into PMS. You know, and there's so many PMS symptoms like, you know, bloating, feeling irritable, um, breast tenderness, change in bowel movements. And so whenever we see that, um, a big part of our like approach to it is like helping them to calm down, <laughs> helping okay. to decrease stress so that their body is able to handle the cha- the hormonal changes easier. Um, and then whenever they go into their cycle, kind of the same thing, you know, um, all of those like symptoms that like we had talked about, you know, whether it's like clots or pain or too much bleeding or not enough bleeding, like those are all like different diagnoses that we have to like dive into. But the ideal period is, you know, no PMS, no cramping or anything like starting naturally and then having like a decent flow you know um, for the first two days the second day should be the heaviest still bleeding on day three and then you know day four day five like trickling down um, and not having any like brown spotting you know before the cycle or brown spotting after the cycle Um, brown spotting can like signal that your progesterone levels may be low so that would be something I'd recommend someone to like look into if they're wanting to get pregnant and they're having brown spotting Um, usually that also pairs with like being cold, like having cold hands, cold feet, lower energy. Um, and then like if, if more symptoms checked off, then I would say, okay, let's check out your thyroid, um, and your thyroid levels. But anyway, so the ideal period, you know, you bleed like those four days and then it just stops, you know, you might have a little bit of spotting, like fresh blood, but no brown blood spotting and then, and it stops. So that's like the perfect healthy cycle you know, for someone who is wanting to get pregnant. Okay. So I've always had very, just different every month, and I've had pains. That was my thing. They were they're very painful to the point to where, like, I would call into work and not go in on a certain oh, day. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, I think I was telling you off air that uh, I changed up the way I was doing things, the my diet, Start eating certain foods during, I learned the phases, so what foods I need to eat during each phase, the seeds, the way I was working out. And now this period, it was pain-free. But I think there's still some other things that I can work with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, I would say if you were having a lot of pain and you, you used to be, like, very active during your cycle, I would definitely contribute it to that that lifestyle yeah. factor of like maybe lifting weights while you're on your cycle. Cause when you're lifting weights, like you're tensing up, right. And oftentimes mm-hmm. we tense our core because that gives us like the strength and the foundation to lift heavier. So you were probably, my understanding would think you're like tensing a lot like this area mm-hmm. so that it was causing more stress and like the blood was not flowing like as smoothly and relaxed as it should have been. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because I would just <coughs> try to push myself through like whenever I would be on it and I stopped doing that yeah yeah and then I would look at like you know stress or maybe diet could also be like really important like if you're having those painful periods like Mm -hmm. like how has your stress been you know like the week leading up to it like have you felt pretty calm and if that checks off that like you you know stress is mild everything's like you know maintained then looking into like how's your diet you know and oftentimes for people like I talked about like getting in a cold pool you know or getting in water Mm -hmm. and then getting out and being cold Mm -hmm. like that also can reflect into like what you're eating so if you're eating a lot of like cold Mm -hmm. icy beverages you know like a lot of smoothies a lot of like cold salads um, yogurts like those things that like are you know refrigerator temperature Mm -hmm. then that can also like inhibit the flow of your cycle and lead to more pain Uh, yeah so I always tell people like when you're bleeding try to eat like a lot of warm foods and soups almost like you know when you're just like recovering from like a little cold or something like you just take things slower mm -hmm. you know and eat like those warming nutrient dense foods 
Mm-hmm. And then if you make those changes, usually we'll see a shift in that pain, kind of like what you've done. Yeah. 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 I feel so proud of myself. (laughs) Yeah. You should be proud of yourself. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy to like, to I, I one be mindful of how you are and then two to like learn it yourself and then three to make those changes so you should definitely be proud um because yeah. we're having to do it for ourselves right yeah. unless you have the support yeah yeah and while I do like like learning stuff on my own I think it's time for me to like actually go to a profession and be like all right just want to make sure I'm doing things right yeah yeah, yeah. and um you know to like I don't know exactly how old you are, but I know you kind of mentioned, um, you know, like late 20s and 30s or whatnot. But like the older we get, like we get on this timeline, you know, of like time is so precious to mm-hmm. get pregnant, to have kids before 40. And so I think like if you are there, you know, if you are like 30s to f- before 40, like it, working with a professional is going to like optimize your chances of like getting pregnant sooner when you feel yeah. like we feel like we're beating the clock in a way, you know, with that. Like, you only have so much time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 32, so I'm a year younger than you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so I feel like I need to. We do want to go on our honeymoon first. We haven't done that. So hopefully next month. And then after that, I'm like, all right. Nice. It's time. It's time. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, y'all are doing everything, like, perfectly. It'll be good. Yeah. Enjoy your honeymoon. And, like, sometimes I'll tell people to... Um, if you want to get pregnant, like take a vacation because you're less stressed, you're more relaxed, you're mm-hmm. out of your head, you're like out of your normal routine. Yeah. So who knows? Hey, maybe. <laughs> I know. Baby number one, honeymoon. Yeah. Um, it happens. It happens a lot. So yeah. sometimes like I've worked with people and like we're doing so many things. I'm like, you know what? You really just need a vacation. <laughs> and I did. I had, I have one patient that I'm thinking of, like they went on vacation and it was mm-hmm. like two weeks and then they came back and they're like, we're pregnant. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like, should you spend all that money on like IVF or should you just spend it on like a hey. vacation and like really getting out of here? Yeah. That sounds <laughs> nicer. It sounds nice right yeah. um yeah who knows who knows what's best i would recommend that i'm yeah. not a doctor but go on vacation <laughs> but go on vacation yeah. i know yeah so we talked about counting your menstrual cycle by days uh-huh we talked about the stages of the menstrual cycle yeah yeah knowing your flow yeah, so no, so knowing your flow is is kind of what I tell people. Just like be aware of like understanding like what your period will look like. So like knowing it and getting familiar with it. Like, do I have clots? Is it bright red or is it dark red? Is there any like brown spotting? So that's really what like knowing your flow is like. Mm-hmm. Kind of like familiarizing yourself with that and like keeping track of it. You know, in an application. Yeah. So. Yeah. What is what is. Clots, what does that indicate? <clears throat> so clots is a sign that, like, the blood is not flowing as smoothly, and mm-hmm. so it's coagulating. Mm-hmm. And that can be for, like, lack of movement. That could be for, like, too many cold foods or, um, like, being in cold water or, like, exposing your, like, abdomen. Like, even girls, you know, that, like, like to wear, like, the crop tops because they're super mm-hmm. cute. But mm-hmm. if you're on your cycle, like, you really want to keep, like, this area, like, warm and protect it mm-hmm. for blood circulation. And, like, maybe avoid those crop tops when you're on your cycle. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So clots are usually just a sign that, like, we need to improve blood circulation. Okay. Yeah. So I don't – so I feel like there's also, like, a lot of myths. I don't know if this one's true. Like, my mom would tell me, she's like, don't shower when you're on it. Yeah. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, that's definitely. um, So, so like Chinese medicine, what I studied is very Mm -hmm. similar to um, like Hispanic culture. And so it's funny because like a lot of things that I learned, like I would tell David and because my my husband's from Colombia, I would tell David and he was like, oh, my God, like you sound like my grandma or you sound like my mom. (laughs) And I told him, like, there is something to this, David. And so with the showering, Mm -hmm. it goes back to like what I've been talking about, like water. Because okay. whenever you shower and you get out, like you're exposing yourself to water to get cold. And so that can also decrease your immune system. And whenever your immune system is down in your cycle already, you could get sick. It could, you know, decrease your blood circulation. 
but like everything in moderation. Do I shower when I'm on my cycle? Absolutely, because I want to feel clean, and it's just part of my habit. Yeah. But like, would you say just do it with warm water? With warm water, okay. yeah, with warm water, and then like cover yourself like right after, like with a warm towel, and like get dressed and like keep your feet covered. Okay. But um, like back in the day, like these sayings came around because. Like, they didn't have, like, if you think really far back, they didn't have electricity to warm the water. So oh, they would okay. use, like, you know, they would either have to, like, boil water to heat it up or they would just use, like, river water, like, water, like, whatever water that they had. Yeah. So that, like, idea really came about, like, back in the day when, you know, they didn't have, like, electricity and, like, all of these luxuries that we now have today where we can just turn on our water and put it too hot and like take a hot shower like they didn't have that and so like another practice that like I know a lot of like people in Chinese culture like what I studied is like after birth like they also don't take a shower and they practice like a quarantine for like that that whole month those 30 to 40 days Mm -hmm. and um, they usually don't allow the the mom who gave birth to shower so water does have like a big um, connection to women when they're bleeding or women when they're weak. Like, mm-hmm. if you look at ancient culture, they usually say, like, avoid it. Like, oh. don't get wet. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. I know. Yeah. yeah. And I do. I know some people that, um, you know, um, are of, like, Asian background, and they gave birth, and they're like, yeah, my mom wouldn't let me shower. She kept me in bed. And so, like, the idea is that they just rest and take care of yourself. And so I feel like in our modern society, like, we've lost that. We've lost, like, that respect for, like, rest and, like, really, like, appreciating it and valuing it and, like, slowing down and taking care of yourself. Like, Mm -hmm. instead, we're always, like, go, 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 hustle. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, this is our timeline. This is my work schedule. And, like, we just have so many expectations because, you know, women are also a big part of the workforce now. We're, like, Mm -hmm. back in the day, we weren't. Right. So there's been, like, so many changes and, like, um, I feel like that that, you know, like restorative um, practice has really like, you know, kind of kind of gone away like in our culture now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like one of my friends, she's Colombian and she was saying that back home, uh, all the women in the family kind of get together and take turns taking care of someone who just had birth. Oh, nice. Yeah. Like they'll cook for her. They'll like, like, all come together. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like knowing the Colombian culture, because I've been in it for like 17 years, Mm -hmm. like there is a huge sense on like family first and like community. Mm -hmm. And like, um, yeah, I see that in my husband's family. Um, Even when I like, I I gave birth, like the family showed up like little by little and they brought food. And like, like I said, my mother-in-law was there right after I gave birth and she was cooking for everyone. And so I think like for her and for them like that's a way that they they know that they can provide and they know that they can help you and like Mm -hmm. nothing's better than cooking a food with love and like giving it to someone you love you know like really when you eat a home-cooked meal it's like oh my god like you feel the love and so um like there's just so much importance into like you know energy and like intention when you're cooking and how it can Mm -hmm. heal someone like after birth yeah yeah I like that yeah it was yeah so fertility awareness, starting young through understanding. So we can yeah. talk to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Preventing pregnancy. Don't have sex during that week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't have sex during that week. I know it's super yeah. taboo, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, in, like, the state of Texas, like, you can't get an abortion. And so mm-hmm. it's real life that, you know, girls still get pregnant, you know, yeah. and if they live here, they're kind of stuck with, you know, the reality of, like, there's no other option, um, like, I, I do work with girls, you know. Um, the idea is not to, like, make them, like, have an abortion, but to help them to, like, continue their cycle. So there's certain acupuncture points in herbal medicine that we can do to um, stimulate and bring a cycle. Uh, so I do have girls that I see, you know, um, often and they tell me okay like you know I just want to make sure like I have a good cycle like you know the cycle should start in five days and so um you know obviously like I don't they don't know if they're pregnant I don't know if they're pregnant they might not be pregnant but um like we still do like the treatment to help like bring a healthy cycle you know with Mm -hmm. herbal medicine and then in the same time I think that they hope that if they were to be pregnant then you know it helps them to like flush and like Mm -hmm. you know not not have a, a pregnancy 
um, I mean, and, and if not, then, you know, I, I do know them and they, they will travel, you know, to get an abortion. So that's like a really, that's a really sensitive topic, you know, like right. being here in such a conservative state too. Yeah. Um, but like knowing your cycle and understanding it so you know when to not have intercourse. Yeah. And then if you did have intercourse, because that's what, you know, our bodies are designed to reproduce. And if it happens, then knowing, like, what steps you can take, you know. And I know there's, like, plan B and, like, all of these things, which I'm not, like, very, very, like, well-versed in, you know, what that looks like. Um, but I do help women to, like, bring their cycle. So they will come to me and then we'll just stimulate it naturally through um, alternative means. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was um, telling my husband, I was like, I don't. Because sometimes you'll talk about health class, and I'm like, I don't remember health class. I'm like, I don't remember learning any of this in school. It's such a blur. Yeah, I think yeah. I was in seventh grade, and they, I want to say they, like, put the condom on the banana or something, you know? See, I don't even remember no. that. He's like, yeah, the sex talk. I was like, I don't remember a sex talk. I don't know. Like, maybe we did have one, and I just don't remember. But. Yeah, I definitely remember it, because I was like, whoa, this is weird, um, <laughs> putting a condom on a banana, but... Yeah, like, the only education that, like, I know I received about, like, health and, like, you know, body awareness was in fifth grade. They talked about, like, the menstrual cycle mm -hmm. a little bit. Like, okay, this is what a tampon is. This is what a pad is. You know, like, introducing it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. But it still didn't prepare me for when I started my cycle. Mm -hmm. And then I remember the sex ed class, but they had mixed, like, boys and girls into the room. So it was just, like, very uncomfortable, you know, uh -huh. like, being a girl, like, having to look at a banana as a penis, <laughs> you know. I was like, this is so weird. And, like, people were just, like, joking. And, like, at that age, you're so carefree and, like, you just want to make fun and, like, be silly right. um, and, like, not, like, pay attention or not take it seriously. So mm -hmm. I do think, like, um, you know, like, the system is not – like, where it needs to be, like, talking about health. Yeah. Like, you know, we didn't even learn about nutrition or, like, anything, you know, yeah. in high school. Um, so I think that, like, the state could definitely improve on, you know, its standards mm -hmm. for, like, educating, you know, the public. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, because I feel like a lot of people have that argument with abortion. And no matter, like, what side you stand on, I really think it should be something that should be taught like so we wouldn't have to be talking about this so we wouldn't be at this point to where yeah you know because it's not not gonna happen right like so like what are the preventative steps you know yeah. um and like i mean gosh i've heard this so many times too and maybe you have but it's like where girls get pregnant you know when they're younger or in their teens and they don't even realize it until months later oh, so yeah. i've heard so many stories about that you know and that's like another thing is you know, they get pregnant and they, they have no idea until, like, five months go by. And they're like, oh, yeah. You know, because, like, they just don't think of it. Like, oh, yeah, I didn't have a cycle. Huh, that's cool. You know. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, like, either it's going to get taught at home or it's going to get taught at school. And I think, like, the state probably relies on this to get taught at home. But, like, I don't know, maybe, like, chances are small that it is. Yeah, I don't know. I know for me, my mom was just like, never do this. And I was like, yeah. okay. But, like, so I used to work at an elementary school. Mm -hmm. And the things that don't get taught at home, because the dad's not there and the mom has to work, it will surprise you. Like, the most basic things. And you're like, you, you know, you don't tell the kid, but in your head, you're like, they didn't teach you this at home? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it does start at home. Yeah, anyway. yeah, it should start at home. Yeah. But, like... Yeah, I think it's tough because, like, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of kids that, like, you know, at home, the home life is not the best life, you know, right. and, like, there's no opportunity to learn it at home, and so, yeah, my heart breaks because I think, like, as a society, like, we will all flourish if, like, there was just, like, better education on some things, like, in the in the school system or in the system, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. On, like, how to understand your body and, like, even mental health. Like, mental health is a huge one, yeah. you know, especially for students. Like, maybe home life is not good, and then they go to school and they get in trouble for their grades or they get in trouble for talking, like, whatever, fighting, mm -hmm. you know, but, like, nobody's prioritizing like mental health in the school you right. know yeah um so and that's 100 percent true because i used to be the interventionist so oh. i would work with the kids who were not doing that great oh wow, with their cool. grades yeah. and when i got to talking to them got to know their backstories it wasn't great at home either 
Yeah. 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 It just like, I, I always think like if, and you would know, but I always think like when, when kids are not doing good in school, it's because they need more love. Like, mm -hmm. and it's something's not good at home. Like, yeah. I don't know if I'm right, but. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Is there, before we go, because we already went past oh, our okay. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is there anything else that you would like to add? No, no. Thanks for having me. And I hope that like your viewers kind of resonated with some of the things that we talked about um, or it piqued their curiosity in the, in the subject. So, yeah. And if they want to reach out to you, how can yeah. they find you? Yeah. So um, my, my personal professional page is at Dr. Period, Sarah Anzola. Um, S A R A H A N Z O L A, and I'm on Instagram. I have yet to get on TikTok. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's like in the future. Yeah. Um, like, I, well, actually, I have the same. It's my same handle on TikTok, but I'm just not like really present. Uh, okay. Um, and then if anyone like lives in Houston or in the state of Texas and wants to work with me, then they can find me at www.templ temple without the e wellness .com. Okay. Yeah. And then, and that's also the Instagram, right? Where yeah, yeah. I also have an Instagram for for my business at Temple Wellness, um, but Temple without the e. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to us and coming back on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It was and a if, pleasure. Thank you. And if you guys liked it, make sure to subscribe. We'll be having more talks on women's health, and send it to someone who you think might need it. Thank you for tuning in to Build from the Inside Out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with someone who could benefit from it. Remember to subscribe to our podcast to stay connected. And here's a special treat for our loyal listeners. Use code BUILT at www.bcnsubs.com for a 10% discount on your next order of BCN supplements. Thank you for being part of our supportive community. We're glad you're here, and we hope you'll join us again in the next episode of Built from the Inside Out.